We are into our, I believe it's our fourth message in the book of Romans. And so we, I do not have time to do an introduction. And, and so I, I, I'm into the introduction of Romans, but I have three different ones, a long one, a medium one, and a short one. And I do not even have time for the short one, but it's interesting, the background to what this was written on. I will say that without the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, no one in this natural life is not guilty, is above judgment. No one through their own actions and natural action with God without the cross, without acknowledging your sin, is not guilty on their own merits. The first three chapters of Romans is really making a point, and you can see that it's including everybody. It's including the secular world. It's including the pagan world in chapter 1. And as you can see today, it's including the Jews, who let's just be straight at that time, were some of the most self-righteous people that ever lived in that time of Jesus. And it's including the Gentile Christians all, in all these Roman house churches. There wasn't one church in Rome or just two. They were all a bunch of little house churches. And keep in mind, at, at that time, there were many Jewish Christians that, that, but, that were saying, oh, you have to be circumcised. You have to this. We have to bring back in the ceremonial law. And and so, and and the different facets of of the Old Testament law to receive salvation along with Jesus. And so, that's what the book of Hebrews was written for. For Jewish Christians who had grown up under the law and were trying to mix the law into their salvation and say they needed both. And so, so there was a lot going on here, but to sum up what we're about to read is that no one through their own self-righteousness and own ability, through their own self-effort, can escape or is worthy in the end of escaping the judgment of God. That's what these chapters are, these first three chapters, and he has to make that very clear before he gets into the fun stuff. And if we are left to our own ends, our own abilities, without the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we would have the wrath of God coming down on our heads. Every single one of us, even the people that think they're good, think they're moral, without receiving God's grace, understanding the grace of God, the New Testament gift of righteousness, You will probably not win. You will probably be miserable. Read the book of Galatians. If you're a Christian that has put yourself under the law, or in the least, you will not reach the potential that God wants you to reach. In our own ends, in our own abilities, without the death, burial, and resurrection, we cannot reach in our own righteousness, in our own abilities and works, the perfection that God requires. That is what these three chapters of Romans are trying to get to. If you're going to be just in God's eyes, you have to live by what you believe, by faith. It's about what you believe, and you have to be humble enough to accept the fact that without God's unmerited favor, you can't make it. And so, this is, see, this, I was thinking about this. This is not a book, you can just read a chapter and put it down. You won't understand it. You have to study this book if you're going to completely understand it. If you just read chapter 3 without reading what, or chapter 2, without reading what's coming, you may be depressed, And so, therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, you condemn yourself. For thou judgest, doeth the same things. 
But, but, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doeth the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? I'm just going to read everything we're going to cover tonight up front, and then we're going to walk through it. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and, and impotent heart treasureth up, that means store unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath. And revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who, who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also the Gentile. Think about this. In chapter 1, he started with the pagans suppressing the truth, trying to change the glory of the incorruptible God and refusing to acknowledge creation by God. And there was judgment when they hit a certain point. It talked about God turning them over to a reprobate mind. That was the first chapter. But here he's going a completely another direction. He's acknowledging numerous times in this chapter, the Jews. Remember, Paul was a Pharisee. He knows all about it. Romans 2, 1 again. Therefore, you have no excuse or defense or justification, O man, whoever you are who judges and condemns another for imposing as judge and passing sentence on another, you condemn yourself. Because you who judge are habitually practicing the same things that you censure and denounce. Notice you've got the words habitually practicing, almost past realizing you're even doing it. Or you could say you have ignored warning after warning. There are some commentators that say with the sin of the heathen world being covered in Romans 1, Romans 2 is referring exclusively to the Jews. But there are many other commentators that do not believe that is so, that the church is thrown in there. And I'm just telling you, of, of all the different scholars that, that I've read, what the opinions are, what Paul is saying is what we just read in this is all, is all who judge others both Jew and Gentile. What he's saying is no one has the superior morality to the point where it exempts them from sin so that they are in a position to judge others. Judging will always involve the sin of presumption. It's, it's presumption. It's the evidence lending probability to your belief. It's coming to your conclusion from a proven existence of another fact. And it's a rush to judgment. Verse 2, but we know that judgment, adverse verdict, sentence of God falls justly and in accordance with truth upon those who practice such things. What this scripture just said is God being all-knowing is qualified to judge because he knows all things. He knows the motives, or you could say what's going on in your heart. So what we just read in verse two is his judgment is always based on truth, the judgment of God. But verse, the first verse, what we just read, the judging of the spirituality of others, you are coming from a standpoint of your own supposed personal righteousness. Looking at the, the, the one Greek commentator, he says there's no excuse for anyone who calls himself a Christian to do such a thing, and when he does, his sin of judging others is inexcusable, and his own righteousness, being a Christian, for those Christians that judge habitually, their righteousness is not in the finished work of Christ but their judgment is coming from their own vaunted opinions of themselves. Still quoting, these people might talk a lot about the Lord, 
as the Pharisees of old did, but they do not know the Lord. And they are below, in a spiritual sense, the very people they are criticizing or judging. And so, and we're not talking about judging biblical doctrine. Okay? Do you understand that? You are allowed to judge biblical doctrine. And so, in verse 1, we read, and that is in the Bible. In verse 1, we read, Whosoever thou art that judges, but not the pagans from chapter 1, just, just, not just the pagans, not just the secular world, you will see numerous times in this chapter, he listed it like this, Jews first and then the Gentile. Remember back in that day, the Jews looked down on the Gentiles. They actually called them dogs, which in the Hebrew was a Jewish slur for homosexual. There are, there are the, these are the people of God, the Jews, and they just put all the Gentiles in one big basket of idol-worshiping pagans and call them dogs. And if you look at the first chapter, when Paul was going at paganism, the Jews would have cheered all that. So he mentions the Jews multiple times here, almost to say, you've got on one end the pagans, many of their religious rituals of that day involved sex in regards to the gods, uh, temple prostitution. And then on the other hand, you've got the Jews who thought they were morally perfect. And Paul's going at the, the secular pagan world, you know, that the little house churches in Rome were looking at every day in chapter one. And those pagans in Rome, just like much of our country, purposely rejected all things concerning God the creator. But the Jews had rejected the light that had been given to them concerning Christ as the redeemer and Israel. And they had far more revelation than the Gentiles ever had in regards to God. But they rejected it. And let's just be straight. They killed the Messiah. So technically, the self-righteous ones were even more guilty than the ones they were accusing. Don't tell me he's not talking to the Jews in their self-righteousness. This is exactly who he's talking to, and he names them by name. Uh, we're, we're not allowed to say that here at Living Word? <laughs> yes, I support Israel. Yes, we go to Israel. Yes, we support the Jews. We're just reading the Bible, and I'm telling you who he's talking to. Verse Romans 2, 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and resteth in the law. Maketh, makest thy boast of God. Romans 2, 12. For as many have sinned without law shall also perish without the law. As many have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. He's talking to Jews. He's talking to pagans. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to everyone. For as many as have sinned without the law, you know, let's back it up. Verse 9. Uh, Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and then the Gentile. The Jews of this day, um, the day that we're talking about that he wrote this, did not see it because of their self-righteousness. Self-righteousness will blind you to what you really are. Why would these guys have needed to repent looking at their morals and how religious they were? But the Pharisees as a whole rejected the ministry of both John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I'm telling you that the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul is not only pointing at the self-righteousness of the Jews, but it is saying all mankind is guilty before God. Verses Romans 2, 3 and 4. Or do you think or imagine, O man, when you judge and condemn those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, you will escape God's judgment and loot his sentence and verdict, adverse verdict. 
Verse four, or are you so blind as to trifle with and presume upon and despise and underestimate the wealth of his kindness and forbearance and long suffering and patience? Are you unmindful or actually ignorant of the fact that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repent, to change your mind? Here's where, where we get to the interesting part. The goodness of God leads to repentance and God will warn someone and he will warn someone and he will warn someone 10 different ways from tomorrow. But what happens is you refuse the warning, you refuse the warning, you refuse the warning. And then verse five, but after that hardness, an imp- impenitent heart treasureth up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. There is a hardness when you refuse and you refuse and you refuse and you refuse, there's a hardness. Andrew Womack has the best teaching on sin hardening the heart that I've ever heard. There is a callousness that King James calls it, looking at the Amplified, but by your callous stubbornness, your impenitence of heart, you are storing up wrath and indignation for yourself on the day of wrath and indignation when God's righteous judgment, just doom, will be revealed. Definitions, definition of impenitence, a trait of refusing to repent, a type of bullheadedness, obstinacy, obstinance, pigheadedness, self-will, stubbornness, resolute adherence, to your own ideas or desires. Do you see what we just read in the Amplified? It says, after thy hardness and thy impenitence, your heart treasureth up. You are, you are storing. You are storing it up. You are, you are piling. Have you ever heard the, the phrase in the Bible, the cup of wrath? How are you doing it? By not repenting. By not acknowledging that you need to make a change. By, if, if, if you just say, God, help me change my mind. I don't want to change my mind about this person. If you can acknowledge it just in your mind to God, you, you're, he knows your heart. You are saying you know this is wrong. What, what did we just read? A hardness, a callous, a stubborn, impenitent means refusing to repent, an obstinacy, a, a self-will, a resolute adherence to the fact that you are right, so you do not repent. First John 1 John 1.9 says, agree with God, is what that means. Confess means to agree with him. There's power in it about your sins. This Bible, I've come to love this Bible, a spirit-filled commentary, a spirit-filled, spirit-filled life Bible. And if you really look at the commentary and you follow the scriptures it tells you to follow, you can almost not go wrong. It will explain everything you need to know. And so Romans 1, 4, not knowing the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. And you don't know that you don't go there. If you don't know it, you don't go there. Not knowing the goodness of God leads you to repentance. It, 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 it hardens. It's a hardness. There's an obstinacy. You're, you're, store, you're storing up. You're treasuring up. The commentary on verse 4 from the Spirit-filled Bible, sinners who are not experiencing God's, not yet experiencing God's judgment. So you just, you, you read it and you go down to the bottom of the page and it, it'll say Romans 2, 4 and you read and it'll tell you, this is what it says, sinners who are not yet experiencing God's judgment should not presume that God's mercy will last even for another hour. Judgment is withheld only to give time to repent. Romans 2, 6, who will render to every man according his deeds. Well, what does the Spirit-filled Bible say about this? 
The phrase according to his deeds does not contradict the gospel of salvation as a free gift that cannot be earned. That's what it says. The verse we just read is summarizing what will actually happen. This is what this says, the commentary of the Spirit-filled Bible. Unbelievers will be judged for their sins. Believers who have been freely forgiven of sins because of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection will be given degrees of reward in heaven according to their actions in this life. Interesting that Jack Hayford put it that way. Do you, do you, do you want me to read that again? Okay, you, you know, there's, there, we're going to come back to this. I'm going to show you the commentary on the screen later. You know, there's a little note in the Spirit-filled Bible. It says, right, right after it says, believers who have been freely forgiven of sin because of Christ's work, this is after verse 6. He will render to everyone his deeds, right? You're, you're going to get what you deserve. The commentary, it says, see chapter 3. Verse 21 through 26. So if you're studying the Bible, what you do, you're really smart if you do what they say. And you'll, because that means you'll understand it more. If you'll go to Romans 3, 21 through 26, when it tells you to, it will help you understand it and how, how it affects you, the person that believes in Jesus. It's showing you how to study. So, so when you see that, you look because it's telling you what's coming. It's, it's saying what's, you need to look at this or you're going to misunderstand this. If you just read this chapter and you don't know what's coming, you're going to be depressed. So the spiritual Bible is telling you right after verse 6, you need to go read Romans 3, 21 through 26 to really understand this. Well, let's do that. Romans 3.21, but now, say but now. now. That's now, that's right now. The righteousness of God has been revealed. Independently, altogether, apart from the Old Testament law. So it doesn't mean the same thing as righteousness in the Old Testament. Although actually, it is attested by the law and the prophets. Namely, the righteousness of God, which comes by believing with personal trust and confidence on, and reliance in Jesus, and it is meant for all of you. If, you've, if you ask Jesus to be your Lord and be your Savior, it's meant for you. There is no distinction. Since all have sinned, oh, read it, and are falling short of the honor and glory. All have sinned. So you've got to have this, this gift which God bestows and receives. Verse 24, all are justified. This is you and made upright, right standing with God, freely, gratuitously, <laughs> by his grace, by his unmerited favor and mercy through the redemption which is provided in Jesus, whom God put forward before the eyes of all as a mercy seat, a propitiation by his blood, the cleansing, life-giving sacrifice of atonement and reconciliation to be received through faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over and ignored former sins without punishment. We're coming back to this. It was to demonstrate to you and prove at present time, right now, in the now season, that he himself is righteous and that he justifies and accepts righteous him who has true faith in Jesus, who believes in Jesus. Then what becomes of our pride and our boasting, the Jew, i.e. looking at the Jews, you know, all that we do under the law, it's excluded, it's banished, it's ruled out entirely, it's gone. On what principle? On the principle of doing good deeds? No, but on the principle of faith. For we hold that a man is justified and made upright by faith independent of and distinctly apart from your good deeds. Works of the law. The observance of the law has nothing to do with justification. Yeah, we're just reading the Bible. The observance of the law has nothing to do with justification. Isn't that interesting? It's telling you how to study here all of that 
that Bible, the Spirit-filled Bible is telling you, you can't read verse 6 and just read it and not learn what's coming. Okay? Or you're going to condemn yourself. You have to know what's coming. And that's why I point to you, just quickly paraphrasing, it's inexcusable whosoever that is judging others. You're condemning yourself. You think you can judge others and escape the judgment of God. You don't know that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. And if you don't repent and refuse the mercy of God, warning after warning after warning, your heart will harden. You will come unrepentant. And you're storing something up, storing treasure up thyself wrath for righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his good deeds, but then you have to go to Romans 3.21 and read what it is for you. You've got the pagans, you've got the Jews, but now is what it said. Did it not say that? A righteousness in the New Testament is a gift which comes by faith through what you believe. And it is for everyone that believes. It says there is no difference because Romans 3.23, it says all have sinned and fall short, are falling short, present tense. You are justified for free, but now, but now you are justified for, for, for free. Isn't it interesting? It talks about repentance though. If you cannot acknowledge your sin, Lord, I know I've been judging this guy for two years. I'm talking to myself, and this has been so good for me. Romans. You have to look at yourself and not be condemned, not be afraid. Take it to God. It talks about repentance. And if you can't acknowledge your sin, And, and you'll, 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 get, you'll talk yourself into believing it's completely okay and you're building the wrong kind of wall in your spirit. Romans 2, 4 talks about the goodness of God leads to repentance. I, or, Romans 2, 4. Or are you so blind as to trifle with and presume upon and despise and underestimate the wealth of his kindness and his forbearance and longsuffering and patience? You are unmindful. You are ignorant of the fact that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repent, to change your mind. Warning after warning after warning. Think about this. Think about this now. Think about this. This is why I believe, I, I really do believe that you have to bring your mistakes to God. I'm not saying every 15 minutes. I'm not saying it dominates your life. It should be a time of actual communing where you go to the throne of grace. But 1 Peter 1, 4, listen to this. By means of these, he has bestowed on us his precious and exceeding promises. Oh, we have promises. And what are these promises for? So that through them, you may escape from moral de decay, rottenness and corruption. These coming promises are gonna keep you from becoming a rotten person that is, that is in the world because of covetousness, lust, greed, uh, shares, and you become a sharer of his divine nature. These promises, remember, these things are going to keep you from decaying morally, and they will help you to walk in his divine nature. That's what we just read. Well, what are they? Um, for this reason, diligence, verse 5, Employ every effort in exercising your faith to develop virtue, resolution, Christian energy, excellence, and exercising virtue, develop knowledge, intelligence, and in exercising knowledge, develop self-control, and exercising self-control, develop steadfastness, and, and patience, endurance, and exercising steadfastness, develop godliness. So this will keep you from corrupt, these are promises. And in exercising godliness, brotherly affection, brotherly affection, develop Christian love. As these qualities are yours and increasingly abound in you, they will keep you from being idle or unfruitful until the full personal knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. They keep you from being idle. They keep you from being unfruitful. But notice what it says here before we get into verse 9. 
It'll tell you, it's about to tell you, if you lack these qualities, if a man lacks these qualities, he's become oblivious that he's been cleansed from his sin. He is oblivious about our forgiveness. If he is oblivious about his forgiveness, he's obviously not repenting. Do you hear what I'm saying? He's obviously not repenting if he's forgotten that his sins were even cleansed in the first place. That's a guy that doesn't repent. He doesn't even think about this in his daily walk because, because if he's aware that he's been cleansed, he's going to acknowledge that sin, have a repentant heart. But it says if you don't have those qualities, you're oblivious to the fact that you have been cleansed of your sins. If you're oblivious... I don't know that you can be repenting at all. Without the repentance, and, and I'm not saying we have to run around and repent every, every 16 seconds. What he's saying is he's jerking the slack out by saying all of you Jews, all of you Gentiles, all of you have sinned and fallen short without this gift that comes through the resurrection. Verse 9, whoever lacks these qualities, you're blind, short-sighted. You see only what is near, and you have become oblivious to the fact that you were cleansed from your sins. Are you staying with me? If you're oblivious to the fact that you've been forgiven and you've been cleansed, obviously you're not repenting. Romans 2, 7, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek glory and honor, immortality, eternal life. Spirit-filled commentary again. Although the phrase well-doing describes Christians, their salvation was granted not because they did good works. You know what it tells you to look at again in this little study Bible? Romans 3, 23. All have sinned, and the Amplified, not the Amplified Classic, the regular Amplified says, and continually fall short of the glory of God. Although the phrase well-doing, deserving Christians, their salvation is granted not because they did good works. And then it says in parentheses, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short because they trusted in Christ, they were granted salvation Still reading the commentary. It is Christ who earned eternal life for them, not because they did good works. So it's reminding you here. Verse 8. But unto them that are contentious, do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. And verse 9. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, Jew first, then the Gentile. The phrase, but to them who are contentious, is carrying the idea of contending with God. The phrase, but unto them who are contentious, in verse 8, this is contention with God. And it's a problem of the world, obviously. They don't want to obey him. They don't want to believe in him. They either deny that he exists, i.e. evolution, or they make up their own religion, saying that they are serving him when it's really all their own making. That's contention. But unto them who are contentious and do not obey the truth. That's what it said in verse 8. What is the truth? This is the truth. The Book of Mormon has nothing to do with the truth. Okay? The Christian church is losing people to Mormonism. The Book of Mormon was written by Joseph Smith in 1830. Once I asked a high-ranking Mormon can I get to heaven if I only acknowledge the Bible and I do never ever read or acknowledge your book of Mormon? Absolutely not, you can't. He told me. You cannot get to heaven by, by ignoring the book of Mormon and only reading the Bible. The Quran, the work of man, therefore it is the work of Satan, just like the book of War Mormon. Man's problem always, has always been that he attempts to substitute something else for the truth something else. And when you look at it, that was Israel's problem. You can't explain the truth like a philosophy. A person's viewpoint, personal viewpoint of wisdom, or at least according to their own understanding, without the Bible, changes constantly. 
according to the outside influence. A person's wisdom cannot be truth without the Bible. Truth does not change. It cannot change. Truth is not an idea. It's a person. It is Jesus Christ who never changes. And it says he came with grace and truth. Moses brought the law. Jesus Christ came with grace and truth. According to John 14, 6, Jesus is the truth. According to John 17, 17, the Bible is the truth. According to 1 John 5, 6, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And the Holy Spirit will not anoint anything that's not the truth. Jesus is the truth. The Bible's the truth. The Holy Spirit's the truth. These three, they don't contain the truth. They are the truth. There's a difference between containing and being the source. You say, what about the Father? Well, Jesus is in the Father, and the Father's in Jesus. According to John 14, 11, and 20, Romans 2, 9, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man who doeth evil of the Jew first and also the Gentile. The Jews had come to believe that they were exempt from the same judgment that was going to come upon the Gentiles because they were God's chosen people. But the Holy Spirit is making it completely clear whether righteousness or unrighteousness, in other words, poison does not discriminate and neither does the judgment of God. Paul, by placing the Jews first, he was saying the truth is absolutely the opposite of what the Jews thought. They were, the, they were given the law of Moses. They were first. And the Judaism of the first century it was not the same system in which the Israelite in the Old Testament was taught to look ahead in faith to a coming sacrifice that, that God would offer for sin. No, that sacrifice in the first century at the time of Jesus was typified the way the Jews looked at it, the sacrificial temple sacrifice, the priesthood, uh, the Pharisees in Jesus' day were nothing but an ethical uh, cult preaching a salvation by works message. And they knew little of God's heart. And Paul knows that because he was in that world. He called himself the Pharisee of Pharisees. Is this, is, are we too technical here? If, if you were me and you had to do tomorrow, would you do the Peter scriptures? Raise your hand if you would do the Peter scriptures. Okay, I'm just making sure. Okay, not trying to... <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm talking, but I'm thinking of other things. Not trying to, not, not trying, let's think about that. Paul, Paul was not trying to kill men. That, he, he was not killing men that were trying to kill him. He was just killing men. And he was a Pharisee. And you're telling me they were good people? How gone are you? How gone are you? In your heart. You think God was in their heart? The religious leadership in the day of Jesus had taken control away from God and was exerting that prerogative for themselves. Jesus himself called them snakes and vipers. Hence, sentencing a good man, an amazing man, a completely sinless man to a gruesome, gruesome death the Son of God. And as we begin to close, I want to show you the actual commentary here. This is telling you what to look at, how to study, where to turn to. And as you read, you're going to go through this chapter. Uh, l let's look at this, Romans 2, 6. Who will render to every man according to his deeds? Okay? Spirit-filled life Bible in which the Reverend Jack W. Hayford your senior pastor may have listened to more Jack Hayford than anyone else in this world. Was the executive editor of this spirit-filled Bible writes this for the commentary. This is what it says. This is exactly what it says. Romans 2, 6, down at the bottom of the page. So you read a verse, and you go down to the bottom, and then you can really understand it. And if you don't completely understand it, you should turn to where it tells you to turn. The phrase, according to his deeds, does not contradict the gospel of salvation as a free gift that cannot be earned. And he says, Jack Hafer says, you want me to prove it? Check out these scriptures right here. See, see how they're all in a, in a parenthesis? You see that? Okay. The verse summarizes what will actually happen. Unbelievers will be judged for their sins. Believers who have been freely forgiven of sins because of Christ's works, there it is. 
C, 3, 21 through 26. That means you should turn there if you want to understand. That's what it's trying to tell you. Hint. Will be given degrees of reward in heaven according to their actions in this life. You want proof on that? You can see all the scriptures you can turn to. So what that is saying is when the verse summarizes what happens with believers being judged, then it points us to unbelievers being judged, then it points us to believers who have been freely forgiven, and Jack Hayford wants you to go to Romans 3. Romans 3.21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, upon all that believe. There is no difference. Romans 3.23, since all have sinned are falling short of the honor and glory of God, which God bestows and receives. Since You have to have this. Since all have sinned and are present tense, falling short, you've got to have this. And that's why Paul in the first chapter says, this, this gift of righteousness, I believe verse 17, is the power of God. Because it is what makes you qualified in God's eyes. Verse 24, and being justified, declared free of guilt, made acceptable to God and granted eternal life as a gift by his precious undeserved grace through the redemption, the payment for our sins which is provided in Jesus Christ. E.W. Kenyon says this gift of New Testament righteousness, it's the ability, when you see righteousness in the New Testament, it is the ability, you, right there, now you know it. See, if you're ignorant of this, you're, you're gonna be guilty with God. You have the ability to stand before God without a sense of guilt or inferiority because of what Jesus did at the cross and through the resurrection. We just read all have sinned and are continually falling short and being justified, declared free of guilt, of sin, made acceptable to God. The Amplified is giving the Greek meaning the word justified. God has declared you free of the guilt of sin. We are justified. We are declared free of the guilt of sin because we have the ability to stand before God without a sense of guilt or inferiority. That's why you're gonna, we're going to run across these scriptures all over Romans, Romans 3.17, or excuse me, Romans 5.17. One man's offense, death reigned, Adam. Much more they which receive an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness are the Christians that reign in life because we are all falling short. We are all falling short. Those are the Christians that reign in this life. Verse 25, whom God displayed publicly before the eyes of the world is a life-giving sacrifice of atonement, reconciliation, propitiation by his blood to be received through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, which demands punishment for sin, because in his forbearance, his deliberate restraint, he passed over the sins previously committed before Jesus' crucifixion. Propitiation means the appeasement of divine wrath by a sacrificial offering. The the, The divine wrath that you and I deserve has been appeased but many people have been ignorant. They are ignorant of this. They don't even know there's, there's a gift called New Testament righteousness. They think it all means the same thing and, and not receiving it. And if you read the book of Galatians, they are Christians that fall under the law. And yes, they wind up judged because they do not even understand their covenant. You perish from a lack of knowledge, the Bible says. And I want to say something. The phrase we just read in the Amplified, he passed over the sins previously committed before Jesus' crucifixion. Jack Hayford, executor (laughs) editor of the Spirit-Filled Bible, at the time of Christ's death, I'm reading the commentary of that verse, God had not punished all sins in the past, going back to the time of the Old Testament. Sin had been committed in the Old Testament 
and no penalty had it been paid in certain instances. But when Christ died, he paid even for those previous sins that had not yet been punished. Think of the generational curses. That goes back. Thereby showing that God is truly just and he never forgives any sin without full payment. Verses 26 and 27. It was to demonstrate and prove at the present time in the now season that he himself is righteous and he justifies and accepts as righteous you if you believe. What becomes of our pride and our boasting? It's excluded, banished, ruled out. We can't. It's not because of anything we do. Uh, on what principle? On the principle of doing good deeds? No. On the principle of faith. What, what I'm trying to tell you, what the Spirit-filled Life Bible is trying to tell you, what Jack Hayford is trying to tell you in the Spirit-filled Life Bible, is this, is this is your focus right here. Since we have all sinned and continually fall short of the glory of God, this has got to be your focus. That's why in chapter 1 it says... The righteousness of God is the power of the gospel. I believe that's verse 16 and 17. This is part of the bridge between God's perfect righteousness and our fallen sin nature. And this is, this is all part of repentance. It is. You have to do something. Be not conformed to this world, Romans 12, 2. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind gets renewed. Next verse. For by the grace, the unmerited favor of God given to me, I warn everyone among you not to estimate and think of yourself more highly than you ought, not to have an exaggerated opinion of your own importance, not to rate your ability Rate your ability with sober judgment, each according to the degree of faith apportioned by God to him. Don't estimate, don't think of yourself more highly than you should, but rate your ability with sober judgment. What, what comes with grace? Humility. The Bible says God gives grace to the humble. And, and, and I'm just saying the judging thing I, I, I had to check myself. It's just like words. It's just like when your words get off and you, you start complaining and saying things and inviting things or inviting things. Judgment, in an essence, the Holy Spirit will check you. And you can judge in your mind, but more often than not, it's going to come out of your mouth. It's going to come out of your mouth. Oh, but I'm praying for him. You're still judging him. You can get caught up. Remember the first verse we hit. Inexcusable, whoever thou art that judgest, for therein thou judgest another. You're condemning yourself. That is not humility. Judging others is the opposite of humility. This is why we have church, because you still have to be aware of these things and know, as it is said in the fourth verse, the goodness of God leads you to the repentance. That grace will lead you to going to God and looking for your mind to change. Asking for his grace to even help change your mind. Change my mind about them, Lord. I just, you can be honest. I just, when I think of them, you know, this has gone on too long. Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God is unmerited favor and blessing has come forward, appeared for what? Deliverance from sin and eternal salvation for all mankind. It has trained us. Think about this. The grace of God, this is the Bible, is supposed to train us to reject and renounce all ungodliness in the end. I never see anyone who hears grace preach and goes off the rails for two years. You know what? Those people, a lot of times, they don't make it. I said, I got grace. I got your grace. <laughs> yeah. Usually those people, they're not around after a while. Right? 
and do whatever you want. It, it will train you to reject and renounce all ungodliness. We just read that it will train you in your decision making. And, but I believe what opens that up is the gift of righteousness because you know you have the ability to go to him and stand before him and not be guilty, not be inferior. And you can be honest with God and you can stand before him and you don't have to hide from him, whether if it's through a preacher or through a friend. More often than not, it's from this. The Holy Spirit can make corrections and he will nudge you and he will nudge you and he will nudge you. Stop judging, stop judging, stop judging. Even the most hardened heart, it can melt. But you have to be willing to say, God, I am wrong. Help me with that. Help me shut my mouth about other people. That is a daily prayer for me. Just recent, every day. Help me stop criticizing other people. I'm just being straight with you. And so I just want to say a prayer and I want us to agree. Matthew 18, 19. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as we close here, as touching anything they, can, they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am. In the midst of them. I don't have time to teach on this, but out of the Bible, the, the, the Bible prayer study course, Kenneth Hagin Sr., he says, don't put any limitations on this scripture. Jesus did not put limitations on this scripture. Jesus says that wherever there are two or more people who are agreeing in prayer, he is right there to make it good, quoting Jesus. Jesus is bringing out the fact that heaven will back us up what we pray on earth in agreement. The prayer of agreement is for us for today. The Bible says one puts 1,000 to flight, two puts 10,000 to flight. Two people do two, 10 times more than one can do. In other words, 10 times. So, so can we just agree together? And if you don't think you need this, then just agree with the ones that need it. Agree with the judges. Okay? You receive, that's what, that's what you go to. We're going to the throne of grace. And receive grace for what? For saying, hey, I can admit this. Right? And he told me I was... When I'm, before I come out, I, I always get on my knees and he says, I want you to get on your knees twice tonight on the stage because I don't want to get on my knees, okay? But, but I do it. If, if it pops in my head, I do it. Twice and for, the, for, the, for, the, for this prayer of agreement, we just agree right now in the name of Jesus Christ, Father, we come before you as a company of believers in unity together. You know that I love these people, Lord, so much, and we are repenting. We are repenting for judging others, judging others in our minds, judging others with our words. We are repenting for criticizing others, slandering others, gossiping about others, and fault-finding in others. We're repenting for every idle word that has come out of our mouths. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your grace, for your New Testament gift of righteousness. And right now we stand before you in that gift that you gave us through the cross and the resurrection. We stand before you in the ability to stand before you without guilt or inferiority. And we ask you to show us. We ask you to train us. We ask you to continue to renew our minds and ask that the Holy Spirit's voice would be so prevalent the spirit of grace would show us how to hold our tongues and quench all the judgmental fiery darts of the devil, the fiery darts of criticism of others. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. Run out of time here. One more thing. 
It's good to put it out there with your words. Can you do this with me? It's, 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 it has to do, you're going to see this a few times during this, this very, uh, this very, these words here, you're going to, we're going to say them together quite a few times during this series. Are you ready? Yes. One, two, three. Lord, I know according to Galatians 5.1, you have called me to liberty. Freedom claimed me when I was called. I do not make my freedom and the grace of God a vantage ground for my flesh or an excuse for the gratification of my lower nature or an opportunity for self-indulgence. I do not let this freedom give a foothold to a corrupt nature, but by love I serve others, I enslave myself to others by the bondage of love, serving others in the spirit of love, walking in love, is walking in the spirit of Jesus Christ. I receive an abundance of grace and the undeserved favor and empowerment and the gift of righteousness. Therefore, I reign as a king in this life by Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 You, you, you. This will help you saying this in, in these sermons. It rem, you know, because sometimes this, this brings out what's in someone's heart and they think they can just run off the rails, right? But I can tell you, anyone that's run off the rails, all right, they're usually gone for a long, long time. And it's bringing out what is really in their heart. And so we're gonna, we're gonna, we're going to softly, softly close the service now. I have, I have prayer tonight here. We pray as a body every week. And I was looking at these scriptures. Look at this, Matthew 18, 18. I tell you, whatever you forbid and declare to be improper and unlawful on earth must be what is already forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit and declare proper and lawful on earth must be what is already permitted in heaven. Again, I tell you, this is binding and loosing. This is exercising your authority. Isn't it interesting? Verse 19, the prayer of agreement. If two of you on earth agree, harmonize together, make a symphony about whatever, anything and everything they may ask, it will come to pass and be done. For who... For wherever two or three are gathered, drawn together as my followers into my name, there I am in the midst. And so, I know I'm a little over for what I usually do, but this, this Kenneth Hagin uh, prayer study Bible, Smith Wigglesworth raised 22 people from the dead. 13 of them were documented. That means nine of them, you know, everyone he raised from the dead, he didn't run around, ah, you come, come see, I just raised her. He, he didn't go report everything. But in the end, by his own mouth, it was 22 people. 13 were documented. Okay, I'm going to read you a story out of this, this study, the uh, Kenneth Hagin Bible Prayer Study Course. And so can you, are you... Do you have the attention span left for four minutes and 30 seconds? Okay, because I timed how long it takes to read this. He tells this story here. He said, Some time ago I read the following account, one of Smith Wigglesworth's sermons. Wigglesworth said that in England, a woman from a Presbyterian church had come to their little mission, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and spoken in tongues. You may remember that when you were first filled with the Holy Ghost, you felt so wonderful, you thought everyone would be glad to know about it. You thought all your friends and family would just be tickled to know about this New Testament experience. Well, this Presbyterian woman thought that those in her Presbyterian church would be glad to know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit too. She went back to church, and when God began to move in the service, she began to speak in tongues. But the elders got up, threw her out of the church. Her husband happened to be on the church board. They had a meeting and informed him that he was going to have to put a stop to his wife speaking in tongues in church or they were going to have to excommunicate her from the church. The man went home angry, stormed in, laid down an ultimatum to his wife 
informed her that she was either going to have to give up this Holy Ghost business and this tongue talking or give him up. He wasn't going to put up with it. He was going to give her 10 days to make up her mind whether she wanted him or the Holy Ghost. <laughs> this woman <laughs> sent word for Wigglesworth to come and pray with her. She needed his advice. Wigglesworth didn't come to visit her as fast as she thought he should. One day he finally knocked on the door. When she answered the door, Wigglesworth to see that her face was red and that she had been weep weeping. She immediately told him it was too late. Wigglesworth didn't know why she had invited him to visit her. He just responded that God was never sent him anywhere. God had never sent him anywhere where it was too late. The woman told Wigglesworth her story. The tenth day of her husband's ultimatum was up that very day. Her husband asked her at breakfast what was her decision. She said she was, couldn't give up the Holy Ghost, so he, so he left. Wigglesworth told this distraught woman, that if they would agree in prayer according to Matthew 18, 19, her husband would be back. She said, yes, but you don't know my husband. Wigglesworth agreed. He didn't know her husband, but he told the woman he did know Jesus. He showed her Matthew 18, 19. The woman said she'd been living with her husband for 25 years, and all that time he'd never gone back on his word. When he made up his mind, that was it. It was settled. Wigglesworth exhorted the woman that God's word is true. He told her if she would agree with him, her husband would be back that very evening. It took Wigglesworth a little time to get her to the place of agreeing because she was looking at the situation from the natural. When Wigglesworth finally got her to see what the word said, she consented to agree with him in prayer, so they prayed. He told her that when her husband came back, she should be sweet, lovely, act like nothing happened. Wigglesworth told her when her husband went to, the, went to bed, she should start playing, praying quietly to herself in tongues. And when she was in the spirit, she could go quietly and lay hands on him to claim his soul. You see, you have the authority in your house. There's something here that we fail to see as we ought to have. You can change things in prayer. Wigglesworth left, and of course, the man came back that evening, and she and Wigglesworth had agreed on it. His wife had his favorite supper. Everything was fine. After he went to bed, she got off by herself to pray. She got to praying in tongues, went quietly into the bedroom, knelt and laid her hands on him, claimed his soul for the Lord. She claimed his complete deliverance. The minute she did that, the guy woke up, jumped out of bed, dropped on his knees, lifted his hands, and asked the Lord to save him. He was saved in a few minutes. Time was filled with the Holy Ghost. He was filled with the Holy Ghost after he was saved. His salvation occurred after his wife took the authority in her house that belonged to her. She took authority in her house. Okay? Je Jesus saying that wherever you are, two people agreeing in prayer, he's right there. Instead of using that authority, we have the authority to bind and loose. Instead of using that authority, many folks just let the devil bind them. They say they can't help it, that the devil is after them. They seem to think they can't do anything about the devil's attacks, but they can do something about it. Every believer has authority over the devil in Jesus' name. If you don't know how to use your God-given authority over the devil yourself, then get into agreement with another believer and bind the devil from harassing you. The prayer of agreement is for us today. And so let's... let's some, sometimes before you pray, you just need to hear a little bit on prayer. We're going to cover your household with one thing at the end. I know so many prayers who love praying for the world, going around the world, traveling the world through prayer, and their households are not covered. What we're talking about is taking authority over demonic spirits assigned to your children, assigned to your home, assigned to your life, and assigned to your marriage. So, Father, we come to you as a company of believers and technically a huge prayer of agreement or it is a prayer of unity. And we lift up living word families and households to you, everyone online, members, non-members, even people that just show up here once a month. From our seat of authority out of our heavenly ministry today, 
We command the principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, the spiritual wickedness in high places assigned to living word children, future children that have not been born, marriages assigned to, or anything that would come against their houses, cars, identities, bank accounts, money, social security numbers, house titles. You stop in your operations. You cease in your maneuvers behind any curse or curses that have been leveled against any living word, member or non-member from any witch, warlock, Satanist, New Ager, or anyone else. We send those curses back to the cursor in the name of Jesus. We command the spirit or spirits behind strife division, competition, jealousy, sickness, any virus, any spirit behind anger, physical and verbal abuse, behind depression and oppression, any disease germ, you stop in your operations against this congregation. Any type of spirit behind an accident, an accident where somebody just consistently gets in accidents, that's, that's, that's a spirit or any spirit behind any injury or, or behind any violent attack. Murder, mass murder, not just our homes, but anywhere they set their feet at their children's schools. We command you, you stop in your operations. You cease in your maneuvers. I feel this popped in my head. Behind Lyme disease, on, on, on people, on their pets, behind their children being bullied. We are taking our authority. We're saying desist in your maneuvers. If you find yourself in a home with someone that has a spirit where they, of self-pity assigned to them, where they invite that thing, they feed that self-pity, I'm sure you understand that it's not a fun deal. We command any spirit is behind self-pity. Do we get a hold or a foothold in these homes against the spirit of poverty, deception, confusion, rejection, abandonment, divorce? We command you stop in your operations and you cease in your maneuvers against living word families, both in the congregation and online. If you do not pray in tongues, Pray in your understanding. You're welcome here. The Holy Spirit knows what to pray. Cover these households. Holy Spirit, pray what needs to be prayed. To restore. Family relationships between siblings. Gazande. We have a right and a demand to claim not just retribution of loss, but seven times over what's been lost. Lost money, lost time, lost relationships. We claim it. Times seven in the name of Jesus Christ. Logozon, bizi, alase, abakona, la basada rabashiti diakarabase. Giana, la bas, irasso totaraba. Revive, revive these homes. Revive living word homes. Revival in the homes. Galaboso, la bashindi. Revival in this church. La ganda, balabosondi, la gadende. A spirit of repentance. La bazindi, kalaba. A spirit of forgiveness. La garaba, shoroba, shindi, di andare, And just quickly, we come against Bill SF. 4292 put forward by our state government. It, it is a law that would change the way we do church. Where a 36 year old man could say, I'm a four year old, and go sit down in the four year old class. Where a man could walk into the female bathrooms. It would change everything. And, then it, and this thing is not over. So we lift that up. We lift that up. And we speak to that. 
we speak what David spoke, shall the throne of iniquity in the Minnesota government have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law. And literally they're gathering themselves against the souls of the righteous. And they're condemning innocent blood, but we say God is our defense. God is our refuge. He shall bring upon them. If they're not going to get saved, he shall bring upon them their own iniquity. He shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yes, the Lord our God shall cut them off. You bring living word families into a large place. You deliver them because you delight in them. And that spirit behind that bill, we command you, stop in your operations. You cease in your maneuvers. We live here. You're not coming against the church in Minneapolis in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I, my, I, who knows what, what my heart rate is right now? It was a workout. But can we, can we get uh, the altar ministers up? And, and if you need prayer for anything, this is what they are here for. This is your company. This is your body. There is, there is power in this. There is power in this. This is, they lay hands. If you, if you would like to, to speak in tongues, they can lay hands on you and you'll speak in tongues. If you need healing in your body, if you need them, prayer of agreement for finances, prayer of agreement for your children, whatever it may be, this is what they're here for. Please do not leave without having them pray for you. And thank you so much, you guys, for coming to church tonight. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I love you, Living Word. I love you, Living Word. God bless you.